Is, can you kind of go over the different types of designs, like the posterior stabilizing and uh, uh, retaining? You know, can we can we touch on those? Yeah. So there's a um, you know there's a couple different designs, and they may sound a little confusing because there's so many different ones. Um, really, you just have to realize that a lot of these designs that don't have a box cut are very similar. It's a lot of marketing tactics by the companies to say theirs is better and they have the best. But, um, you know, the main kind of constraint, constraint is what we're going to be looking at. And we're going to kind of classify these from low constraint to high constraint. So the least constraining implant is an implant that doesn't have a box. It doesn't have a cannon post. And so you may hear these referred to, I would say the least one, the least kind of uh, constraint would be a cruciating, uh, cruciate retaining implant. And the goal behind the design of this implant was um, you retain your PCL, you keep that in place. That's going to provide some stability and, you know, may, and then the patient should have a good result with that. There was at one point an even less uh, lower constraint than that, which would be a, uh, they had a bicruciate implant where you would retain the ACL and the PCL. That didn't work out very well. It had a lot of, a lot of failure rates. Uh, failure rates. Um, so that was kind of X'd off the market. Um, so next step, we talked about cruciate retaining. You retain the PCL. And then the next kind of level of constraint, you may have heard it referred to as either a cruciate stabilizing um, a PCL substituting implant or a, um, you may hear a high flex poly, a deep flex poly, a medial pivot poly, a dual pivot poly. Um, basically what all these mean uh, is it's conformity of the polyethylene. So those type of implants do not have a box cut and the polyethylene is just more conforming. Um, so uh, it can be more lift anteriorly and more lift posteriorly. And basically the goal of the design of, let's say, a cruciate stabilizing poly or that category of poly um, is to try and recreate uh, the protection that the PCL would impart to the knee. Um, so they've done fluoroscopic studies where they take these knees uh, through a range of motion and Normally you get femoral rollback where you go down to, into deep uh, flexion and the femur actually roll back, rolls back. So what they found in these um, uh, knee replacements is you get paradoxical motion. So the knee actually, when you flex it down, if you're looking at a lateral fluoroscopic view, the femur will actually start to shift anteriorly. And instead of it rolling back, you're actually getting the femur sliding forward. So these highly conforming polys are, some are built with a nine millimeter anterior lip. Um, to try and prevent that paradoxical motion, to try and impart more stability to the knee. There's been studies in, uh, in Journal of Arthroplasty looking at in these cruciate retaining, and cruciate stabilizing uh, designs that is there a difference between you actually taking the PCL or leaving the PCL and they found similar results. So there's, even though the implant was designed to maintain the PCL, whether you release it or you don't release it, um, you know, there was no difference in complication Right. And that kind of goes into another sector of balancing the knee and balancing the PCL, uh, which we can get into in this talk a little later. Um, so then kind of the next level of stability after the cruciate stabilizing type knee would be a posterior stabilized implant. And so the posterior stabilized implant um, was kind of the... Uh, first generation need to uh, recreate the PCL. And it's been around forever. It's a great design. It works very well, very high success rate. And so there's a box cut and there's a post on the polyethylene. And that post basically tries to recreate the PCL and prevent the femur from uh, sliding forward. So that cam engages the tibial post as you go down into flexion. And so the goal of that is to recreate rollback. Does it actually recreate rollback? It's hard to say that there is still this want for the need to go into this paradoxical motion. Um, but that's kind of the next level of constraint. And a mis uh, there is a misconception that if you have a post, it provides some varus valgus stability. 
a regular posterior stabilized implant, the post does not provide any varus valgus stability. It is literally just there to prevent that anterior translation of the femur. So then the next, um, the next kind of level of constraint would be a varus valgus uh, constraint. Um, so going from the posterior stabilized implant to a varus valgus uh, constraint, this is one level before, before that kind of uh, final level constraint, which would be a uh, hinged knee. So the varus valgus has a wider post. And usually in these types of designs, the wide post will fill up the box very, very tightly. And um, so there is still some varus valgus motion, usually about maybe um, anywhere from uh, three to 10 degrees, depending on the implant. Um, but it does create more stability in the varus valgus uh, plane. A lot of these implants, these posts have to be reinforced with a, uh, with a metal peg that goes in it, and that's to prevent this uh, post from breaking because there's so much so much strain on it. Um, so this can be great for a, a revision type case or a case that you're going into where maybe there's a 20, 25 degree deformity and you may need to balance the knee. Um, and it may be impossible to balance. You may still be lax on the medial lateral side. And I think the varus valgus constraint is a great option um, to kind of deal with that without having to go to a hinge. Um, you know, hinge is a great design, but the longevity of putting a hinge in is not always that good. Um, you know, I try to, the way I think about it, and you know, not everyone may agree with me, but, you know, putting a hinge in almost makes you a little bit of a second class citizen because that's not you know, these come loose. There's so much um, stress at the uh, implant um, bone interface uh, of the hinge design because it's locked. It's a linked construct. So those forces have nowhere to dissipate except between the bone and the implant interface. And so when you're talking about getting to a hinge, uh, it is a great bailout for some cases. If someone has like a uh, neuromuscular disease or, um, um, or some type of insensate limb or uh, a multi-ligament type uh, knee injury where, you know, nothing else is going to help them except a hinge design, you know, it's great for those cases, but, um, you know, I'm always hesitant to jump right to it unless it's needed because there, uh, there is a high failure rate with those. And so I, I did hear you mention about, you know, the patients who would probably uh, be, have a better, you know, have a more successful outcome with the constrained designs, but who gets the, the like the posterior stabilized implants versus the cruciate retaining implants? And are there patients who you wouldn't do those for? Um, yeah. So, you know, if it's a, it, it depends on, you know, neuro exam is incredibly Im, Im, uh, important. If someone, you know, has a, uh, a Charcot knee, for example, and they have uh, no neuromuscular control or it's in sense state, um, you know, that's someone who, and if they have, usually with that type of knee, it's usually in pretty bad shape. So the, uh, the ligaments, medial, Collateral ligaments and LCL ligaments may not be intact, so that's someone I'm uh, I'm leaning towards uh, uh, doing a hinge design. In the past, you um, you know they talk about that you should do a posterior stabilized knee on a rheumatoid patient. Um, you know I think that uh, that is true to some extent. I think people are really pushing the boundaries with their, these newer type knee designs with these highly conforming polys. Um, so you know, a lot of the times for me, revision, uh, the varus valgus constraint or the hinge design, they're really, um, really for my revision type cases, unless it's a really bad primary and it's some type of Charcot joint or some other uh, previous like multi-leg injury. I'm, uh, uh, it's really reserved for the revision stuff for me. And the, the, was the thought process, I'm just curious, was the thought process behind the patients that had rheumatoid um, for them, was it because that the rheumatoid would do so much damage to the, the soft tissues like the ligaments 
um, you know, like the collaterals uh, as well as accruciates that they may need a higher level of, st- I guess, stability per se. Is that is that what the thought process was behind that? Yeah, that that is that is uh, exactly the thinking behind it. You know, the other thing, if they're a rheumatoid patient, you know, it's recommended you. Some people resurface the patella, some people don't, some people are selective, you know, rheumatoid, I think is a criteria to resurface the patella because it's a cartilage inflammation disease. Um, these rheumatoids don't have good soft tissue. So um, you want, you don't want to put in a non posterior stabilized knee and then show up with a dislocated knee because they're rheumatoid and they have terrible soft tissue. So the extra level of constraint in the rheumatoid type patients is exactly for the reason you said, because they have poor soft tissues. Mm-hmm. Makes perfect sense. I'm glad that you went through that. I think the designs is, you know, is something that's uh pretty basic in the land of orthoplasty, but it makes, you know, it makes a whole lot more sense if 